Uh, it's so, so good just to, to be here, to represent IDES and the staff and so many people that, have, uh, that are going to be working and, and dealing with, uh, with the, the harvest funds. It's amazing, and it's, it's overwhelming to me to, to just to, to, to be here for that. So again, thank you. The, the total is just is great. It's such a, such a blessing uh, to, to hear that. Um, it, when I first heard it, it was just like, I don't, I don't know what to say, and it's, it's, uh, it's just so great. So uh, I'm the project manager at IDES, and I handle the communication with our, our partners overseas and our board of directors and uh, help with the, all those different projects all around the world during times of disaster and hunger. Uh, and then when there's not those uh, times of disaster or hunger, we'll do uh, development projects or evangelistic projects. Uh, we'll help uh, a family or a church with a well or with a farming project to help them get, get them more established, um, help with uh, leadership training and those kind of things to help. Um, so I make sure the projects are going, are going according to plan, coordinate with the forwarding agents, the organizations, and the people, making sure everyone's kind of on the same page. A lot of communication involved with that. So on a typical day, I'm in spreadsheets a lot. Some of, I find that exciting. Some of you might find that not as much. Um, I do a lot of email, a lot of phone calls. Uh, com- communication is a lot, of, a lot of what I do. When I'm not doing that, I'm on the field visiting the, the different fields and trying to understand their culture, helping them, making sure we don't have a blind eye to what's going on over there, um, to make sure we're not missing something because of what they're doing. So I go over there to learn. I found myself in some of those places on the backs of uh, doing different types of transportation, but on the back of a motorcycle one time going through the city in India at 150 miles an hour hugging on to this guy thinking I'm going to die at any moment but I I didn't I made it back safely but that's that's my job I it's 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 boredom or it's sheer terror and there's no in between in what I do I guess so it's just one of those things but honestly I get to connect brothers and sisters of um, here in the States with brothers and sisters in other countries, and it's a really kind of a cool thing to bridge that gap in the communication through it and making those things happen. It's, it's a really good thing to see what is going on, even with the bad things. Um, there's still, God is still blessing those ministries and blessing those people, and, and I, we get to be a part of that. Have you ever been overwhelmed by a gift, similar to you know when I first heard the number about the Harvest of Talents, I was very overwhelmed. But have you ever been overwhelmed by a gift and didn't know, really know how to respond? Maybe it's a, a new car or some jewelry for an anniversary and maybe you didn't have the words to speak or, or maybe you cried or, or something like that. Um, I, uh, my, uh, we were visiting some friends uh, in July one year. My wife had coordinated that. We don't get to see them too often. They live pretty far away. And so uh, we had tried to do everything we could with them. Um, and so we, I was out with the husband at a coffee shop, and we were meeting all the church to kind of get together, I think, before service or something like that. But we walk into the church building, and everyone's like, surprise, surprise. It was like his birthday surprise, and I, I didn't know it was happening. And so I turned to my friend, and like, surprise, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was your birthday. And he's like, no, no, it's for you. I'm like, no, 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 that's impossible. My birthday is two days before Christmas, and it's July. <laughs> So I, I, I ultimately found out that it was a birthday su- uh, surprise birthday party for me in July because we had never seen, we don't see these, these family uh, too much, but it was a, a big surprise for me. I had no idea what to do, and it was the first time that I had ever been surprised like that for a birthday. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that was uh, pretty overwhelming for me. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, talking to a minister that was helping out after the fire, helping with fire relief after the, the fires in California and Washington and Oregon. And this minister was going to help coordinate um, helping a family that had lost everything. Their house was down to just the foundation. They had lost one car, the tires were gone, everything was burned up in it. Um, they were able to get as much as they had into their one vehicle and get out just a few hours before the fire took everything. And we're talking about how things are going to go. They have to work through insurance, and they have to do all the things that they need to do. Um, and we're talking about the plan and how that's going to look, what he can help with, what he can't help with. And I remember getting down to the number where the board had approved and, and, getting to, and talking to him about that, and he, he broke down. It was overwhelming to him. He just didn't know what to say. And I, and I, I get so focused in my job sometimes um, um, and what we do, um, we would uh, help with, uh, you know, with uh, a flood relief in the Philippines, um, helping with a, with a village that just had flood relief, and we'll rebuild homes and, and help with food, food and clothing. 
um, and that can cost, you know, $50,000. Um, or we could do a food distribution in Myanmar with refugees, Myanmar Burmese refugees, um, and that could cost around $30,000. Um, or we could rebuild, help rebuild a roof after a, hur a hurricane down in Florida, um, and that can be up to around $10,000. And those numbers are just outrageous to me, um, but um, for me, you know, given my oil change uh, for paying too much for that is outrageous, but these numbers are just outrageous. But this was this last week for I. It's just a portion of what we had done. And so it's just amazing what we can do and the blessing. And, and with that minister, it was just to, to see, uh, to talk to him about what he was able to do uh, with that funding. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Nehemiah today and, and about the different things that what I see in, in your ministry and in his ministry. Nehemiah was overwhelmed as well. Nehemiah had a task before him to rebuild the wall and this was something that, that uh, he wasn't ready to do, but had to, to take care of it. And I see a parallel between his ministry and yours, and I'd like to share what God is revealing uh, through that. And so we're going to go through, just real quickly, just a, uh, a note here. Nehemiah, the whole book, is amazing, and there's going to be so much you can pull from it. And I would encourage you to look at that, because um, I'm not going to seize things that you were able to see because of your ministry. But just some, just some observations I have here. So Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And as I heard these words, I sat down, I wept, and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. So what did Nehemiah do when he found out the task that he had before him? He prayed. And I know that the, the Harvest team and the Lincoln Christian Church, for to do what you've done for as long as you have done it, I know that that had to be bathed in prayer. To know that, God, I can't do this. There's no way that I can take this whole thing um, of this big task before me without you. And so what, what Nehemiah did and what, what uh, you guys have done is praying and asking God. And we see Nehemiah's character in this. We see that he was caring about the people. Um, he had concern about their condition. Um, and he didn't rationalize, well, I'm here, they're there, there's no way that I can do anything. It'd be easy for us um, to rationalize what we do and the ministry that we do feeding people. To say, they're in Haiti or they're in Zimbabwe there in Tanzania. There's no way that I can do anything like that. Um, but it would be real easy to, to rationalize the way he, uh, he didn't do that, and neither did you. Um, we also have the thing called like the, the bystander effect. You might have heard of this before. In, in an intense situation like a disaster, or maybe someone's having a heart attack, and they're in a room of like 50 people or 100 people, and nothing is done for that person because everyone else thinks that somebody else is going to do it. And that is a very dangerous thing that could happen. So we don't want to get in that mindset either that, that somebody else will do it. And I know I've seen over the years that you did not do this. This is something you said, I'm going to take care of it. We're going to do it. And it's been a blessing uh, to each of our ministries because of that. So what did Nehemiah do? In chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, we'll just read there. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruin with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now he prayed, and then God said, Nehemiah, you're going to be a part of this. You're going to do this. And I know that uh, God has tapped you on the shoulder and said, you're going to be a part of this. You're praying for the people. That's great. But you're going to be the one to take care of this in some form or fashion. And to do that, it takes that, that brutal frankness um, to know it. I Meaning, you know, I was like, we have to do this. And you can't do something um, like the Harvest of Talents for so long to, um, by just having some niceties. There has to be this understanding that people are hurting and people are starving and people are, some people are even dying. Um, they have to be uh, pretty open and pretty honest about what the conditions of what's going on. And so we have to be honest with each other and what we do and what we can do uh, for these people. Um, so the br brutal frankness may open the eyes too long glazed by inaction. But open eyes need a new vision. Nehemiah gave them the renewed hope by calling them to a plan of action and inspiring them with his personal testimony. 
And we see that with the harvest of talents, knowing that people are getting fed every day. So what did Nehemiah do? Chapter 3, he actually built the wall. He actually did the task. Uh, chapter 3, is the people work systematically on the walls. The building work is described. The workers are named section by section. Uh, the point of this account is to show that people as a whole responded to, to Nehemiah's challenge and believed that God would give them success. The description of the work is, demonstrates the concerted effort of the people. And this, is, this sounds like the heart of the talents. There's no way that this one person is doing this ministry. It's, a, it's everyone doing it and working, it, working together. It's a remarkable list of individuals who share the responsibilities of the work. Priests led the way, but the people from all walks of life joined in, truly making this a joint effort. Uh, they cut boards, they laid stones, they set doors, they baked cinnamon rolls, they quilted. Wait a second. I'm, I'm, I'm mashing my stories together there. So just to be fair, Nehemiah did not make cinnamon rolls, but, um, but that's, 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 not, that's not biblical. So. But chapter 3 is not intended to chronicle the completion of the wall. It's the, it's the uh, prep work showing who was involved. To me, uh, in my notes, I just wrote down that Nehemiah chapter 3 is just harvest meetings, uh, hot meetings, anything uh, you do to get ready and prepare for it. Um, I always think it was funny to have a, a Jeopardy question. How many hot meetings does it take to pull off an event like this? Uh, it's got to be a, a lot. And I'm, su- I'm assuming there has been a lot of extra meetings because of everything that's been going down uh, with this, with this uh, current year. Um, but it, it, it has to be done, and, and, and it continues to, to get done. So what did Nehemiah do in chapter 4? Well, it wasn't really what Nehemiah did, but what could have been done to him. In chapter 4, in verse 18... We read that, and each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Now, Nehemiah uh, could have uh, um, had opposition um, against his cause. People jeered at him and made fun of him. And uh, there was this danger of actually being, a, there could have a potential be an attack. Could you imagine Trying to do what you're trying, trying to fulfill a task that you need to do. They have a trowel in one hand and a sword in another, just waiting for something to happen. It would be very difficult conditions to work. And we know from any type of ministry that you've done, there's going to be opposition. And the work that we do at IDES, there's always kind of opposition, whether it's the government that's putting in different uh, codes or, or stipulations or if it's people, even if the government's going after the church because of, the, of what they do and that they're following after God, there's all kinds of opposition in ministry. And we can just write down 2020 is going to be in opposition to what we're doing. So there's going to be opposition to the work, and we have to continue to know that God is going to ca- take care of it. And I thought it was interesting to have the, the trumpet player there uh, next to him. That, that was there as a reminder. If something was going to happen, there would be a call to arms um, but also let them know that if attack came, they would, be, they would have to fight, but they'd be fighting for the cause of God and that he would be by their side. And we have that as well, that God is going to work for us and get through us, and we see that, um, examples of that um, in so many different ways. What did Nehemiah do? In chapter 5, was a thing, it was a section that I um, honestly jumped over a couple of times when I would read through the book. Um, but Nehemiah 5, verse 3 says this. There are also those who said, uh, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our houses to get grain because of the famine. So the context doesn't say whether it's a natural famine caused by, uh, by nature or it's political or economical. Nehemiah just knew that people were hurting. And he had the task at hand that he had to do, but he still had people at, on the outside needing help. And uh, we see that all the time too. There's going to be more hurricanes. There's going to be more famines. There's going to be more disasters in what we're doing and with, the, with our ministry. And there's going to be people that need help. You might be helping with a harvest of talents, but there's going to be people in your lives that are continuing to need help. Um, and so I definitely see that parallel uh, with, uh, with each of our ministries. Just because we're doing one thing doesn't mean that there's something else is going to pop up. Um, as, I, as I close, I, I didn't want to come and just kind of share what I thought you should do because to spur you on to, to do the Harvest of Talents. You've been doing that for many, many years, even when I was a, a little kid. But I wanted to kind of point out 
And hopefully, as you look at Nehemiah's story, you'll see some more insight into your own story and what God is trying to teach you and, and show you with all the different things that are going on. Um, but I want us to say thank you. Um, I get to be a part of what the blessing of what you've done for so many years and to work through and to how, um, you know, actually get the food in the people's hands. And that's so, it's such a huge blessing to be a part of that. Um, so thank you for that. But as I look through this verse that I always kind of go back to with, again, there's disasters are going to continue to come um, every day. We're going to have something we're going to have to work through next week. I don't know what it's going to be, but I usually use Galatians uh, 6, 9 as a verse that I use to kind of continue to move forward. And I, and I want to close with that because I think it's something we can use, all use, but I have a little bit more insight I'd like to kind of give you. So Galatians 6, 9, and I, you've probably heard this verse many times, but let us not become weary in doing good. For at a proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Now, again, I've read this verse many times, but I've looked and I don't know, for whatever reason, it caught my eye, the word good. And why is it mentioned there uh, twice? And so I, I looked it up and I'm not, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I was able to see that it actually is two different words. We actually work at a disadvantage in, in our Greek language on, on how this kind of plays out. The word good is a very simple, easy word, but there's actually more to it if you kind of dig a little deeper into the verse. So the first, let's not become weary in doing good. Uh, this is actually uh, kalos, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, but that means useful, uh, suitable, or functional. In Matthew, it's the same word. It means good fruit or bad fruit. Uh, since we're talking about fruit, also uh, jams and jellies, that's, that would be good. Going on a walk, a walk is good, or, or playing uh, uh, with your kids, is, that, that is good. Um, those are very functional, very suitable, uh, regular kind of things. Um, now, the second good is agathos. Uh, it's more about people. It could be as simple as just a relationship or as complex as God's will. So agathos implies a relationship with someone. The works of God are good. The people of God are good. Um, the people of God shall do uh, his good works. Christian deeds become good when they are exercised in the response to the direction of the Spirit. So my son is good. There's that relationship there. Our work here is good. So what brings us from that good to, to, that, uh, to that other good, that agathos good? And I like to say that, um, explain it by this way, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't raised in the church. Um, I didn't, didn't really know what that meant. We didn't, my family never went. We always had this idea of who Christian, what Christians were. But I did get invited to a backyard football game that actually was held at a church. And um, do you remember that overwhelming gift that we were talking about earlier? Um, for me, that's football. Um, it's kind of might seem silly, but football is, is a good thing. Exercise is a good thing. When I visualize the game or that backyard game, um, or even just think about a football, I think about the youth leader in my life that used that good to move that to a relationship with the church, to move that to a relationship um, with God, to help me understand that I needed saving and I needed that relationship. So it moved me from good to another good, that holy good, that relationship. And I know there are people um, out there that are going to be receiving rice, they're going to be receiving bread, they're going to be receiving these things from the good offerings that you have done and they're going to uh they're going to see it's good they need it and it's definitely a, a a good thing but it's it's a purpose it's going to move them from one good to this other good it's move it from a functional you know giving life kind of a thing to even a, an eternal eternal thing an eternal good and so i just i find it very uh, insightful to you know that we don't want to be grow weary in doing the good things whether they're functional or whether they're eternal. We got to do the things, the regular work to move to those things. So what are our similarities that we have for the Ides ministry, the Harvest of Talents ministry, Lincoln Christian Church, our partners on the field, we have these similarities that God has given us each a task. They're all very challenging, they're rewarding. We're going to have opposition and it's going to look differently in different places. Um, but we're reminded that God is with us and people will be fed and that will move us and, change, and continue to change lives through that. So on behalf of the Ides ministry and of all the people that are receiving that good food from that good work that you're doing, moving to that better, that more eternal good, thank you so much.
Let me pray. Father God, thank you for, for this church and thank you for everything that they've done um, over the years, Father. We know that you're working. We know you worked in Nehemiah's life and we know that you're working in our lives. We ask that you continue to help us to be open, open to new opportunities, um, to help us to see the things, the, the things that you've given us, the talents that you've given us, um, to, be, uh, to enjoy the things that we're doing, uh, to move us from one good to another good to move us from uh, focusing on the task at hand to the more eternal blessings that you've given us, Father. I thank you for this church and for everything that they've done in this season. We continue to ask you to take care of us as we continue to work through this pandemic and, and what that means with this new normal, Father. We thank you for the ministry and our ministry partners. We ask you to give them safety as they continue to work and continue to, to, to work on these opportunities that you've given them through this food. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.